All right, this is part two of the uh, ratio analysis um, segment of videos that I'm working on for you. So let's get to where we were and kind of go into a little more detail about uh, what some of these ratios are. We left off here with a discussion about the different types of ratios. So let's get right into some of them. The first one here is a current ratio. Now, the current ratio, as it says, takes the current assets of a company over the current liabilities and whatever that ratio is, it is. So if a company has $100 in assets and $50 in liabilities, current liabilities, then it would have a current ratio of 2. Uh, this information is, of course, uh, extracted from the balance sheet uh, in terms of the uh, trio of financial statements we've reviewed. Um, and typically speaking, uh, the higher a company's current ratio is or the greater number of current assets uh, they have relative to current liabilities, the stronger financial position they're in. The lower the current ratio is, the poorer the potential performance is of that business and, and more of a warning flag could be raised because one might ask if a company has a current ratio of even less than one, which is of course possible where you have more current liabilities than you would have current assets, where is the company going to get money from to be able to pay for those assets, uh, for those uh, liabilities rather. So let me just quickly jump out of here and take you to uh, Yahoo Finance. And on Yahoo Finance, there are a lot of different uh, resources that we've touched on that are available to you and one of the ones I'm just going to show you I'll just pick one company let's just say um, uh, Walmart okay and if you scroll down once you get to Walmart you can see it's at eighty six dollars and thirty one cents um, and you go to uh, Walmart's balance sheet okay now in the balance sheet here for Walmart, you could see their total current assets over here of $61 billion, $185 million, and their uh, total current liabilities of $69 billion. So that's kind of interesting. Um, where is Walmart going to get, because they're short, you can see here, by $8 billion, where are they going to get the current assets to be able to satisfy their current liabilities? Well, they may not. They may have to get it from some other source. And in fact, if you look back over time, like this goes back to 2012, you'll see that in 2012, they had current assets of $54 billion, and they had current liabilities of $62 billion. So again, a six or $7 billion shortfall. So where did this money come from? Well, if you look through uh, some of their sources of potential funding for this, you could look at a couple of things. You can see right away that under the short or current term, uh, long-term debt, which is money that's borrowed by Walmart, increased from $6 billion to almost $12 billion over that same period of time. So, you know, here's an example of a company that could not uh, come up with enough uh, current assets to satisfy their current liabilities, but then borrowed money over that period of time. So they have an increase in their long-term debt, most likely to satisfy the uh, current liabilities that they had the previous year. So that's kind of how you can jump around to sort of sort of like being a, a spy or an investigator or a detective to try to figure out, you know, where is that this information, where is the missing piece to this uh, puzzle, and, you know, how are they funding their business operation? It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's just you need to find out how they're funding uh, and paying for their uh, their current liabilities because you know if it's a company that's constantly incurring debt and debt and debt and isn't growing that quickly that could be a potential warning sign right there all right so getting back to the um, the PowerPoint slides let's just go to uh, where we were which is here and this is an example of a current ratio calculation 
um, for this fictitious company that's in the textbook. There's also something called the quick ratio or acid test ratio, which is like the current ratio, except it does something sort of interesting. It takes out inventory out of the picture from current assets and then divides that over current liabilities. Why do we do that? Well, analysts like to do this because it's useful to know if, if the company had to come up with money to satisfy its current liabilities, what if it couldn't sell its inventory at the stated amount? Or what if it couldn't sell its inventory at all because the economy turned south and really started to erode? Um, does the company, without its inventory being factored in, have enough current assets to satisfy its current liabilities? It's a very interesting and useful ratio, and that's why we use it. In this particular example, you'll see from the previous slide, the current ratio for this company was 1.63 there in purple. But then when you take out the inventory, you can see that their quick ratio is less than 1. So that means that their, their current assets are largely represented by inventory. It's not totally uncommon for this to happen, but potentially a warning sign for you to look into uh, if, let's say, things got bad and they couldn't liquidate their inventory, how would they go about satisfying their current liabilities? Would they do it as Walmart did it uh, in the previous example when they went on Yahoo? Or would they sell more stock? Would they sell an asset? And, and so on and so forth. Um, there's another a liquidity ratio that's cited in the textbook called the average collection period. And it basically poses the question, how many days does it take this company to collect its accounts receivables? Again, accounts receivables are monies that are owed to a company from its customers. You know, you shipped some goods to somebody and you said, you don't have to pay me for 60 days. Okay, boom, that's an accounts receivable. Most businesses have accounts receivable. Um, but a lot, some businesses don't or business types don't. For example, restaurants typically deal in cash transactions. They don't have a lot of accounts receivable, although they might for, let's say, a catered event or something like that. But in general, they don't have a lot of accounts receivable. Most companies do. So what this tells us is how many days is it going to take us um, before we're able to collect the accounts receivable that's coming in. Um, and the way you do this is you take the annual uh, sales amount that was done on credit, which generated the accounts receivable. You divide that by 365, so you have a, a per day uh, credit uh, sales uh, rate. And then you divide that into the accounts receivable total that is on the balance sheet. And when you come up with a number, it says in this example that it's going to take this company approximately 20 days to collect its accounts receivable. Is that good? Is that bad? Personally, I think on the surface that sounds good. Um, like in my business that I have in New York, um, my uh, accounts receivables uh, are not collected on average. I, I probably don't collect them for 35 to 40 days. Um, I may just have bad customers. I don't know. This company may just be really good at collecting money. Um, but what you need to look at is you compare this 20-day figure with its competitors, you know, to see what uh, the amount of time is that other competitors take to collect their accounts receivable. And this can speak to uh, access to cash that a company might have and also management in terms of how well it's operating its business. The inventory turnover ratio is important too, and it's a simple calculation of the cost of goods sold, which is taken from the uh, income statement, and inventory, which is taken from the balance sheet under current assets. Um, so you, now you're like sort of intertwining two different financial uh, statements with one another to do these ratios. Um, typically speaking, shorter inventory cycles lead to, as it says on the graph there, greater liquidity. Um, so, you know, if a company is able to quickly turn over its inventory, 
um, then that could be a, a sign that the company's generating cash on a fairly regular basis. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But if it takes a long time for a company to turn over its inventory, well, that could be problematic in terms of a cash drain or strain on the business. In this particular case, this company that we're using as an example in the textbook has an inventory turnover ratio of 8.63. So this means that uh, the company turns over its inventory in totality uh, almost nine times per year, which is good. You know, if a company is only turning over its inventory once a year, um, that might be a problem sign. Um, you know, because maybe it's still adding inventory that it doesn't need to add, and maybe the stuff it has in inventory is antiquated and so forth. Uh, this is an interesting graph because it lets us do a comparison between uh, different companies within the same industry, Dell, Apple, and Hewlett Packard, and it lists some of the ratios there, uh, current ratio, quick ratio, uh, accounts receivable turnover ratio, and the inventory turnover ratio. Uh, a couple of interesting things just kind of jump out at you here. Uh, first of all, uh, with the inventory turnover ratio, uh, Apple and Dell have a relatively close uh, inventory turnover ratio, and it's above the industry average. But there you have Hewlett-Packard with a much lower um, inventory turnover ratio. So this would be uh, sort of a question you'd want to ask of the company and their CFO and find out why that's the case. There could be some explanation for it, but it could also be a problem and a warning sign. So you know, sometimes comparing and contrasting these ratios is not only uh, critical but imperative you know, to be able to uh, value businesses. Um, capital structure ratios include the debt ratio, which basically says of not the current liabilities, but total liabilities, um, what percentage are our total liabilities as a percentage of our assets? So hopefully, you know, if let's say your total liabilities are $100 and your total assets are $200, well, your debt ratio would be 0.5. Um, if your total liabilities were $100 and your total assets were $100, your debt ratio would be 1%. So as you can see from that simple example I just verbalized, a higher debt ratio is not good. It means that you're, you have an increasing amount of your total liabilities as a percentage of assets, which obviously can lead to many, many different issues uh, that come up. Profitability ratios uh, address many different things. Um, one of them is the gross profit margin, which again is at the top of the income statement, uh, revenue minus cost of goods sold is gross profit, and you take that as a percentage of sales or revenue. That's a useful indicator because people will always say, what are your margins? And you know, comparing the margins of one company with another that's a competitor of it can tell you a lot in how a business is being run. The operating profit margin is the same thing, very useful. It's the uh, er, uh, uh, operating income, which is the earnings before interest and taxes, uh, divided into sales. And again, by comparing it to a competitor or to the uh, peer group average, uh, can tell you if a company is above or below uh, its peer. And, and again, might uh, indicate to you whether or not the management is doing a good job or not. So here, the peer group operating profit margin is almost 16%. Uh, this company has a operating profit margin of less than that. So, uh, you know, not much less, but less nevertheless. So you want to see why that's the case. Uh, the net profit margin is the bottom line in the income statement divided into sales. And again, good to use in terms, in terms of comparison. A return on equity, as it says on the slide, um, is a firm's uh, a net income, which again comes from the bottom of it, uh, from, uh, from the income statement, um, over the amount of common equity, the dollar amount of common equity, which we can get from the balance sheet. So how much money is being returned to shareholders? Like what is that return on investment, so to speak? Uh, market value ratios include the price earnings ratio and the market to book ratio, which I'm not going to cover in this video. 
Um, they are important. There's a couple of test questions about these ratios, so make sure you cover Chapter 4 in detail.